appreciate you being in the Bible study. I was praying this afternoon around the altar, and I was asking the Lord that he would help our folks to uh, not be hindered by Satan's uh, voice today and given an excuse to not be here because school had started this week, and one of our kids and grandkids in the bed, and, and uh, my wife said, well, you always get us out uh, by an hour. We're gone, but... I said, I know, but I know how Satan works, too, to try to hinder folks, give them reasons not to be here. So I'm tickled that you're here. What a real blessing it is to my heart to have you here in the house of the Lord. I hope you had a good day, a good half of the week so far, and look forward to what the Lord is going to do for us in the next uh, few days. He's always good, amen, always good, and uh, all, all the time, amen. And uh, so I appreciate you being in the house of the Lord. Uh, tonight, pray for those that are working, those who are not feeling well. Ask that God would help them uh, as they miss the service tonight. Good to see you, Genesis. Genesis 43 tonight. Genesis 43. Do pray for the workers tonight downstairs with our children and teens that God would use them for His glory. Uh, it is our goal and purpose to reach our children and teenagers for the glory of God. I want to see them saved at an early age and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's begin reading in verse number 1 of chapter 43 of the book of Genesis. 43, verse 1. And the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. And Judah spake unto him, saying, The man did solemnly protest against us, saying, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. If thou wilt send our brother with us, we will go down and buy thee food. But if thou wilt not send him, we will not go down. For the man said unto us, Ye shall not see my face, except your brother be with you. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt, dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether ye had yet a brother? And they said, The man asked us straightly of our state and of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have you another brother? And we told him, according to the tenor of these words, could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that in Christ's name you will use the service for the I pray that you would bless those that are assembled in this auditorium this evening. I thank you, Lord, for their willingness, Lord, their desire to be in the house of the Lord for this Genesis Bible study. Thank you for those, Lord, outside the church, Lord, all across, uh, Lord, this country and across other areas of this world that has, uh, Lord, already downloaded last Wednesday's night, Lord, and have uh, some, Lord, have choose to uh, uh, watch this service by the um, uh, webcast, and we sure thank you for that. I pray you'll use me for thy glory. I pray you'll speak through me. I pray, God, for any hindrances or any things, Lord, that would try to veer me away from pleasing you. I pray you'll give, uh, Lord, me victory, and you will touch me and use me for thy glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Genesis chapter 43. Now, in the biblical record that we studied last Wednesday night was Genesis chapter 42, we we saw how that the chapter ended with the reuniting of Jacob with his nine sons. And these nine sons had went down uh, to Egypt to buy corn. Their family, you remember, were, were hungry. And you remember that the famine had been for seven years. Uh, well, the good plenteous years of seven years had came, and two years of famine had came, and they were, found themselves starving and out of food. Not only was Jacob and his nine sons, or his ten sons, including Benjamin, but also their wives and their children also that were starving. And so uh, they've been sent down in chapter 42. They've came back, but 
They, there's one less son. Simeon has been left in confinement by the ruler Joseph. Of course, they don't know that it is Joseph that is the ruler. Uh, but this ruler has said that you need to prove yourself that you're not spies. And so I'm going to keep Simeon right here with me. And that way when you come back, you bring your younger brother. And that will prove to me that you're not liars and that you're telling me the truth. And so these nine sons home to Canaan land and to their father Jacob. And the Bible says in the latter part of chapter 42, they begin to unpack and unload like we would do from a long journey. Remember, this journey was around 260, 280 miles long, and it could have possibly took them around four weeks to travel this far. And so it's been a, all in all round trip, about almost seven, eight weeks of a trip. So they, they come back with provisions and corn and they begin to unpack, and, and they realize as they're unpacking that they look in their sacks, and the money that they originally had took to Egypt to buy the corn, now that they've got back to Canaan, is still in their sacks. And, and of course, they're horrified by that. They're worried. They're fearsome about what's going to happen to them and their family because of Pharaoh. Uh, they thought that, uh, no doubt, that Pharaoh... Uh, would take vengeance because they had cheated the Egyptian government. And so uh, the Bible says as uh, they, uh, there's, I don't know how many months that they, it took them to eat the corn that they had gotten. Uh, I, I, I believe that Joseph, with such a desire to see his, his father Jacob and to see his brother Benjamin, see them all together at the same time, all 11 brothers and his father. I believe he just gave them enough to feed them for so long so that soon they would be back. Uh, I believe it was in the same year we're going to see uh, later in this chapter. I believe it was in the same year that they came back with all that corn that in that same year's time they had to go right back to Egypt to get So that's where we find ourselves in chapter 43. They're all back except Simeon. Of course, you remember the words that Jacob said in in chapter uh, number thirty, uh, chapter forty-two, verse thirty-six. Jacob said them. He said, "All these things are against me." Look at the last sentence uh, there of verse thirty-six of chapter forty-two. He he believes Joseph is dead. Simeon now is uh, uh, is in confinement of Pharaoh's uh, prison. And uh, now they want to bring Benjamin there. The ruler wants Benjamin to come to Egypt too. And so uh, with his heart broken, he says, All these things are against me. And we studied Romans 8.28, and we talked about how that there's only really two attitudes that we can have about our troubles. And they are, they are found here in this chapter, What the words of Jacob. We can just throw our hands up. We can just uh, get discouraged and allow our bottom lip to drag the dusty road of life and, and just be negative and say, all these things are against me. Everything's against me. Or we can do as Romans 8:28, and we can say, all things are working for me. And God, God help us that we have that positive attitude. And we'll, we'll not say, all things are against me, but we'll say, all things are working for me for good for me, Romans 8, 28. Now, as we get into chapter 43, go with me to verse number 1 and 2, and we'll try to go through this chapter uh, and share with you what we believe the Lord has given me, and I hope it will be a blessing and will help you in your spiritual growth for the glory of God. Verse number 1, chapter 43, the Bible says, and the famine, this is the same famine uh, that is gone about two years now, uh, the same famine, not a different famine. This Remember that there was going to be seven years of plenty, and then there would be seven years of grievous famine. And so the famine was sore in the land. It just got worse. You remember the Bible says that Joseph said to Pharaoh that this famine will be so grievous and it will be so sore that it's going to be so bad you're going to forget about the seven good years. You'll just totally forget about that. And so the famine was sore in the land. And it came to pass, verse 2, when they had eaten up the corn which they had brought out of Egypt, their father said unto them, Go again, buy us a little food. 
Now Jacob and his sons and their families, his wife, their wives, their children, maybe some had, some had some grandchildren, I don't know, but there were definitely sons and children here, and they're at the brink of starvation once again. It wasn't long ago that uh, jo- Jacob has said earlier in the last chapter, uh, chapter 42, he says, When Jacob saw that there was corn in Egypt, Jacob said unto his sons, Why do you look? one upon another. Behold, I have heard that there is corn in Egypt. Get you down thither and buy for us from thence that we may live and not die. They were on the brink of starvation that time. And here, I don't know how many months later, they're on the brink of starvation again. They're about to starve. All the corn that they had brought from Egypt has ran out. They, they may, after they saw how, how little portions they had left, they may have took, uh, uh, maybe they got down to eating one meal a day, each person. One, I don't know what they were trying to do to try to, uh, 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 to, to keep them from starving to death. It finally got to a place where they had to say, we're going to starve if we don't get some more food. Now, you remember Jacob's attitude and spirit about them going back to Egypt a few months ago when they said, we'll go back, but we've got to take Benjamin. He said, no, Benjamin's not going. Uh, He had no desire to go back to Egypt or his brethren or his sons and his uh, youngest son, Benjamin, to go back. Had no desire for that. But when God wants to do a work in our lives, he can put us in a place where we'll have to move anyway. It may not be our desire. We may say, I'm not going to do that. I'll never go that way. I'll never be like that. But God can do things in your life to put you at the brink of starvation, so to speak, where God will move you for his glory. Amen. God is in control. And God had to get Jacob and all his family at a point where they were going to head back to Egypt, down to Egypt. Now, we know that God is working in Israel. When I say Israel, I'm not only talking about Jacob, but I'm talking about his sons, the 11 sons. Joseph was the 12th. And, and God is working, and ultimately, you that know the story, ultimately, we're going to see Jacob's descendants resign in Egypt, and they're going to be under Egyptian rule, and that's going to lead to bondage, and then that's going to lead to their deliverer Moses, and that will lead to their journey to the promised land, the land God had promised them. God was in control of the whole deal. God wanted Jacob and all 12 sons to end up in Egypt. That was God's plan. And so uh, God is working, and, and they don't see it, and they don't understand it. So often I know we don't understand it, and we don't... Uh, We can't see what God's doing through our troubles and through our trials, and we think we're going to die like Jacob and his sons and their children and their wives thought, but God is in control. Hallelujah. And so now we see that in verse number 3, the Bible says that since Jacob, finally after all this time, he now has brought up Egypt again. I, I would believe that he didn't bring up Egypt again for so long until he had to. Jacob knew in his heart that what was told was, hey, we can't go back to that ruler unless we bring Benjamin. He knew that. He tried his best, I believe, Brother Keith. He tried his best to not bring that subject up. He wouldn't talk about it. He wouldn't even think about it. But God put him in a spot that he had to deal with it. And so now in verse 3, Judah speaks up. You remember that Judah, you had Reuben was born first, then Simeon. Uh, and then you had uh, Judah and Levi, and so Judah speaks up. And he says, the man, he's talking about Joseph here, he didn't know it's Joseph, but he's talking about the second ruler of Egypt. The man did solemnly protest, solemnly protest in us, saying, ye shall not see my face except your brother be with you. He says, Dad, I don't want to be disrespectful. I, I, I'm not trying to... Uh, to have rank above you and your authority, but I've got to remind you that this ruler of Egypt who is in charge of who buys corn and how much they can buy said to us, I don't want to even see your face in this land unless your younger brother Benjamin comes with you. And so he reminds them of that. Now, uh, I I was going to cross-reverence Genesis 42. Look at verse 33. 
and 34. This is what jo Judah is speaking about. And the man, talking about Joseph, we're in Genesis 42, the last chapter uh, of last Wednesday night, verse 33. And the man, or Joseph, the Lord of the country, said unto us, Hereby shall I know that ye are true men. Leave one of your brethren here with me, Simeon, and take food for the famine of your households and be gone. And bring your youngest brother unto me. Then shall I know that ye are no spies, but that ye are true men. So, if you do that, I'll deliver you, your brother, and ye shall traffic in the land. It says, that's the only reason I want you to come back. You better bring your younger brother with you. So Judah says, Dad, do you remember that? Father, do you remember? I told you, I know you were not there. I know you were not there in the presence of this, of this ruler of Egypt. But I'm telling you, I'm serious with you, Father. He says, don't you come back unless Benjamin comes with you. Now, time had passed since the last time Jacob and his nine sons had had a conversation about that subject. They, there was not much conversation, I guarantee you, about Benjamin going with his other eleven, or his other ten brothers back to Egypt to prove that they were no spies but true men. But yet they knew that if they were ever going to see Simeon again, if they were ever going to get any more food during this famine, Benjamin was going to have to go. That was the rule. Jacob, he had not been accepting that, but now he's going to have to come to the realization that either you spare Benjamin, because he's worried about Benjamin dying, or yet you let everybody else in your family die. And Judah is saying, Father, would you let one man live and let the rest of us die? And he probably said, Father, Benjamin's going to die anyway. He's going to starve to death too. And so he's, he's not being disrespectful. He's just trying to reason with his father. He's trying to speak to his father. Now, look at verse number 6 and 7. And Israel said, Wherefore dealt ye so ill with me, as to tell the man whether we, ye had yet a brother? He says, Why in the world? He said, Since we're going to talk about it, it's your fault. Why did you bring up the subject that you had another brother anyway? Where'd that come from? I mean, how did that come up? The man don't even know us. He's over 250, 60 miles away from us. He's an Egyptian. We're Hebrews. He's way down yonder, not on the Chattahoochee, but in Egypt, amen. He's way down yonder. And uh, he says, listen, he says, what did you do to make him even think you had a brother? He has no idea God's working. <laughs> and sometimes we say, God, what are you doing? Do you even know what you're doing? And yeah, he knows what he's doing. And so he says, how in the world could, could he have known that we've got another, I've got another son, you've got a brother? Verse 7, they answer. And they said, the man asked us straightly, I mean right to the point of our state, of our welfare, of our kindred, saying, Is your father yet alive? Have ye another brother? And we told him according to the tenor of these words, Could we certainly know that he would say, Bring your brother down? Dad, Father, understand this, please. I mean, the, the, the man has asked some very personal questions, and I don't know where he's got the mind to ask these questions, but he asked us how our father was doing. I mean, we... He's worried about our dad. And then of all things, he says, do y'all have a younger brother? Another brother? We had to tell him, we had no idea, Father, that he would say, okay, here's the deal. Since you say you've got a younger brother, next time you come down to Egypt, you better bring him with you. You see the wisdom of Joseph, doesn't you? God gives wisdom to those that will ask. Amen? Amen. He'll give you wisdom if you ask. And so they said... How in the world was we going to know that this ruler, an Egyptian, would ask about our father and he would ask about if we had another brother? I mean, what's the chances of that happening, Father? <laughs> oh, we think that the chances are small, God's still big. Amen? All right, go to verse number 8. And Judah said unto Israel, his father. You remember Jacob's name was changed to Israel. 
send the lad with me. In other words, Benjamin, send him with me, and we will arise and go that we may live and not die, both we and thou and also our little one. In other words, said, if Benjamin don't go, we're all going to die anyway. You're trying to protect Benjamin's life because Benjamin and Joseph were the sons of your love, Rachel. Joseph is dead. Jo- Joseph is gone. And so now you're trying to hold on to Benjamin. But, Father, I'm telling you, if you hold on to him too tight and you don't let him go, then we're not going to get any. We're going to waste the gas. And gas is $3.65 a gallon right now. And we're going to waste gas. We're going to waste time. We're going to see our wives and our children for uh, probably four, five, six weeks. It's just no use to do it without Benjamin. Benjamin is a vital piece of this if we're going to survive. Please understand that. And verse number, look at verse number 11 through 14. And Judah says, you know, I'll take care of him. He says, I'll, I'll take care. Trust me, Dad, I'll take care. I'll guard him with my life. And their father Israel said unto them, If it must be so now, do this. He says, if, if it's got to be a must, and it was a must, wasn't it? It was God's must in their life. God wanted them down there. He says, Here's what I want you to do. Take of the best fruits in the land in your vessels and carry down the man a present, a little balm and a little honey, spices, myrrh, nuts, and almonds. And take double money in your hand. And the money that was brought again in the mouth of your sacks, carry it again in your hand. Preaventure, it was an oversight. Take also your brother... And arise, and go unto the man, and God Almighty give you mercy before the man, that ye may send away, that he may send away you, or your other brother, and Benjamin. If I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So Jacob is finally con- he finally realizes that there's no way out of this. They've got to go down there. It's the only place that has corn and food to spare. And I can just, I can just imagine, and, and I, I, don't, I would think that this was something that crossed his mind when he got a present together for Esau. You remember that? And he thought, if I could tenderize Esau's heart, Maybe Esau will have mercy on me and my family and won't kill us. You remember he was, I forgot, around 500 animals and he put them in different sections and he put, uh, he put uh, uh, Bella with her children and Zilpah with her and Leah with hers. And the last group that went was Rachel with Benjamin and Joseph. And each group had gifts that they were to give to Esau. And, it was, and he would say, what are these gifts for? And they were to say, your, your, uh, your brother Jake, Jacob sent these. Joseph remembered that story. He was one of the ones that went to present himself to Uncle Esau. And so he says, why, it worked for my dad. I believe I'll, uh, uh, Jacob says, let me get my, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. J- Jacob, says, Jacob says, it worked for Esau. It's got to work for this ruler. Don't know who he is, but let's try it. And so he gets the gifts together. And he says, I want you all to go down there, but you carry some of the honey and spices and myrrh and nuts and almonds and take double your money. Why? Because, remember, we brought money back that we're supposed to spend and left in Egypt the first time we went down there. And he says in the latter part of verse 12, look at this, preaventure, it was an oversight. He said, hopefully, the Egyptian ruler when he sees y'all again and y'all bring double money and y'all tell him what happened, said, I don't know what happened. You know, we left and came back and the money that we were supposed to give you the first time we were here, it was in our sacks again. He says, maybe, just maybe, he'll consider it a mistake and he'll forgive us and let us live. And so they're doing everything they can to get ready to meet this ruler. Now, This ruler, Joseph, who they just call the man or the Lord or the ruler, have no idea it's Joseph. And Joseph had been in Egypt for 
had been since 17 years old, he was placed in that dry pit. And then he was sold to the Egyptians, to Potiphar. And then finally, at 30 years old, he was exalted to be second in command. Seven plenty years has passed. He's 37. Two years of famine have passed. He's around 39 years old at this time. So from 17 years old to 39 years old, he has never seen his father Jacob nor his brother Benjamin, who he loved with all his heart. 22 years has passed. And so now they get ready, these ten brethren. Remember the eleventh is Simeon. He is in jail there in Egypt. So ten of the eleven that was there with Jacob uh, for so long are now getting ready to take these gifts and they're heading back down to Egypt. Now, let's. I, I wrote this down. I don't want to miss this. The ruler Joseph, I'm going to just read it because that's the way God gave it to me. I'm going to read it. The ruler Joseph had been in control of all these proceedings, of all these developments. He's the one that told his servants to put the money back in their sack. Are you with me? The reason they came back with the money they had took, Joseph said, put it back in their sack and go ahead and add some more goodies for their journey. Add a Twinkie or two and a, and a bunch of Coca-Colas. Of course, they're probably Christians, drunk Pepsi, not Cokes anyway. Is my wife in here? And uh, but uh, there she is. And I said, and said, just fill them up. Just, just let them have food. They're going to be okay. And uh, they didn't have any idea what had happened. They had no idea. And they don't understand that the ruler, the ruler, are you with me? The ruler, Joseph, was behind all these proceedings. He was behind all these developments in their lives. How often. At times, our great ruler, Jesus Christ, allows things in our lives that we don't understand. They had went to eat down to Egypt with money to buy corn. They were going to do it right. But when they got back, they figured, hey, we stole this corn. We didn't even pay for it. I mean, they thought they were going to be in trouble. They thought, man, we are in bad shape here. And they thought to themselves that we don't understand. And they probably fought in their minds and in their hearts to try to understand what was going on in their life. They resigned in themselves that what happened is just a bad deal. It's just an inconvenience. And so, no doubt, they probably got discouraged by it. And so often we get discouraged when we just consider, well, that's just a bad deal in life. Just the way, the way life goes. Just an inconvenience, preacher. And, and we're not careful we can get upset and discouraged because of that event or events in our life. Are you hearing me? But may, may we trust the great ruler, our God, and say within our hearts and in our minds that I, I don't know what's going on, but our great ruler, our great God, is truly still in control. And no matter what comes in our life, He's able to help, He's able to strengthen, and He's able to grow us even in the hard, harsh times of life. Amen. It's a beautiful picture. They were the brethren of Joseph, were they not? They were, come on, I need to answer. Were they not his brethren? Were they not his family? We're part of the family of God, the great ruler. And we don't realize that when bad things happen in our life, the, our Father, the Ruler, the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, of the whole world and universe is still in control. And we may not see what He's doing, but God help us to not get bitter, not get discouraged. God help us to just trust Him. And one day the darkness will become light. And we're going to be tickled and we're going to be excited that we trusted the Lord even in the hardest. Don't you know it's easy to trust God when everything's going hunky-dory? Hey Amen. Can I get a witness? It's easy to trust the Lord when you've got a little money in the bank. It's easy to trust the Lord when the doctor says, boy, you're just healthy as a horse. It's easy, you know. But boy, with those times when it's hard in your life, God give us the strength and the fortitude to dr just trust the ruler. Just trust Him. He is behind all these developments. He is behind all these events that is going on 
in our life. Look at verse number 14 again. Jacob says, these are the last words he says to his ten boys. And God Almighty give you mercy before the man that he may send away your other brother and Benjamin. And he says, if I be bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. Bereaved is just a, from the word, you can, from that word comes our word bereavement. It means a loss of someone because of death. He is saying here, I am suffering a pain as a father that I've never got over. You remember when they brought Joseph's coat of many colors back? You remember that? They put the goat's blood all over it, and they said, we found this coat, it's shredded. Some wild animals must have got a hold of Joseph. And he wept, and he wept, and his... His other 11 sons tried to comfort Jacob, and Jacob would not be comforted. He would not be comforted. He chose to live that way. Now, I want to say this because I've never been in some of your shoes where you've had to bury a child. My heart goes up. I, I, can just, I, 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 I can't imagine how it would feel to have to bury a child. I, I, I can't imagine that. I can't imagine that. I hear people say, well, the children are supposed to marry their moms and dads. That, that's not always God's plan. Sometimes the parents have to bury the children. God's plan is always right. And when people say, well, it shouldn't be this way, you're questioning God's will. You better not do that. And so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, you know, uh, I've, we were low at times and wonder what God... Our daughter, you know, that crossed our mind. We knew that uh, she could die from her cancer. We knew that. It wasn't, it wasn't surprising if she did, but God touched her. And I thank God for that. Thank you for your prayers and the way you've supported us. But those of you that have buried a child or grandchild, I know part of you will always be missing. That's part, especially you moms or grand, uh, grandmas, because it's from maybe your child, that their child. They come from your and and I know that that uh, it, it, when their birthday uh, would have came, they don't have birthdays anymore. They live eternally in heaven. Or when uh, those things, those dates come up, you remember things, and you sit at home, and you remember when you look through an album, and you look at photos, your heart breaks. But I'm telling you, God can still give you victory where you don't spend the rest of your days bereaving over that child. You can miss. Jacob said he chose to just bereave for the rest of his life. Nothing was going to comfort him. Even his other children that were left couldn't help him. He says, they're not going to help me. I'm choosing to cry about this till the day I die. You know, things come in our lives, and we can cry about it and choose. I'm going to cry. I'm going to just whine about it. I'm just going to just never be positive, never, never do something. Never get over it, in other words. That's, that's not the right decision. God allows things in our lives, whatever it is, to grow us. And what about helping so many other people that are now going through that? Don't you know you uh, could be just a special blessing? There's people that when they're... Well, I, can't, I can help them through Scripture, but I've never been there. But those that have been there are a special blessing to them. And, and God can use us. No matter how bad we think life gets, we've, it, it's all about our attitude. And we've got to show the world that come hell or high water, Jesus can still give us joy. And you can rejoice over the fact that your child, your grandchild, your husband, your wife is in glory land. And, and they want you to live with joy in your heart. They want you to live for the Lord because time is short. And we'll be together in heaven forever anyway, man. And so may God help us to not do as Jake. Jacob said, I'm going to be brief. He said, if something happens to Benjamin, if something happens to Simeon, if they kill him, then I'm already, I'm already miserable. I'm already sad. It's not going to change me anyway. I'll just continue to be sad. That, that's a sad in our lives. When God brings so many things in our lives every day, to give us joy and to make us happy. I was, um, I, 
Brother Jimmy had bought me a ticket and to a, uh, they're having this week the PGA uh, Championship, the last, their last major of the year, and I, you know, I love golf, and he had bought me a ticket. And, and I decided I'd take Morgan and Matt. They'd never been. And I took them, and uh, there's about 120 players. The top 98 of 100 in the world is there in Atlanta, the Atlanta Athletic Club. 